Pete here for a creepy little book with Ava Forte Vitale, archaeologist, Egyptologist, lecture series at the Morbid Anatomy Museum in Brooklyn. So, I mean, I guess when, when it comes down to it, uh, you know, in the ancient world, that animal sacrifice isn't so far out. You have the, you know, the ancient Hebrews practiced it. Uh, you know, I've, I've read uh, a lot about the Eleusinian uh, mysteries, and, you know, there's a lot of bull sacrifice there, and the Romans worshipped the, uh, the, the bull as well. There's a lot of that going on, so... So I guess that wasn't too far out. No, I um, mean, the Egyptians have a very long history of worshiping um, the bull as well. The Apis bull mm -hmm. was one of the most sacred animals, and we have actually many um, preserved mummified version of the sacred animal. <laughs> it's really great. There's a couple pop up oh, there's one in DC, um, but you get to see them, and they were very much treated, you know, to the good life. You know, we get a lot of dialogue about the Egyptians worshiped cats, the Egyptians worshiped animals, and it's a, once again a little bit more nuanced than that. The Egyptians believed that their anim that animals and some of their gods shared characteristics, and they could tap into those characteristics by highlighting sort of their animal nature. So you get these gods with the heads of animals that represent sort of these features. It doesn't mean they're worshiping that animal, it means that sort of they're saying like, oh, you know, Sakmet and her warrior lion goddess sort of iteration, that's who I want to call upon. Which is when you get to see sort of these animal mummies. And that becomes a big part of the religion is they have temples, they're raising animals for sacrifice, and it's not, you know, your brain kind of goes, wait a minute, they worship these animals, but then they're killing them. And it's because they believe that the animals would take a message to the god. They believe the animals worked as a sacred messenger and they would be reborn into the next life, so there's not kind of like this weird disconnect between like you're killing the animal but you're worshiping it. Also, you know, when later in Egyptian history, it's sort of close to when the Greeks come on the scene, Egypt had been taken over by foreign rule mm -hmm. and they really wanted to go back to sort of national pride. They wanted to show the things that made them Egyptian and one of these things was this return to animal mummies. And so, you know, at one point in the 19th century, I think it was something like they took away two tons of, you know, disintegrated cat mummy to use as fertilizer in England. You know, they <laughs> shipped it off because um, it was, you know, millions and millions of animals. I'm assuming that ancient Egyptian beliefs, and, you know, I was somebody who was raised, you know, in Catholic school and, you know, Catholic this, Catholic that. My take on that religion is that it's really obsessed with death. And, and I would, you know, looking at Egyptian culture from the outside, it seems like they're crazy obsessed with death, too. And, and I wonder how much of this Egyptian faith that spans, you know, thousands of years and of course changes over time, how much does that carry through to even religious practices today? It does to a certain extent, but I do warn people, and this is one of the first things whenever I'm teaching a class I kind of go over with my students, is um, we see it through a very specific lens. I always remind people that Egypt is a country where 90% of the people live on 3% of the land, and that's still the same truth today. Um, since the Nile is such a limited resource and it really makes that area home to a lot of people because, you know, the Nile used to flood, it used to lay down sort of rich soil so that you could have your farmlands. They couldn't venture that far from that. The thing is with modern Egypt, yes, there's a little bit more expansion, however, still it's the same area. So we don't actually have a ton of domestic architecture, which is sad for me because that's really where my passion <laughs> is. Um, but we don't have a ton of domestic architecture because the people are still living on the same spaces. So we really, the places we have preserved are the things that we built out in the desert, which are these mortuary things. I also say to people, just think about it in terms of your own neighborhood. I'm here in Astoria, which is a very Greek and very Islamic um, neighborhood. And if you type into Google, religion or religion institute or anything like that, you know, immediately you get dots all over Google Maps of things that are here. But if you think about the percentage of people here that go to that religious institute once a week, it's a lot lower than it would seem looking on that evidence. Then if you think about the amount of people, okay, so maybe people go once a year, or maybe people go for special holidays or when something bad's going on, mm -hmm. that's another thing. Then there's someone like me who I don't regularly go anywhere, but I wear St. Anthony every day on my wrist because mm -hmm. I lose stuff a lot. <laughs> so you get different levels of people, you know, reacting and using the religion that when you take away the human and you take away the everyday aspect, it's kind of hard to read how much these structures are actually getting used because mm -hmm. you see them on a huge scale. I'm not saying the ancient Egyptians weren't focused on the afterlife. That's not what I'm saying. But I, there is a nuance to it. And we even get in their own texts, we get people saying, disbelievers saying, like, well, nobody ever comes back to tell us anything. <laughs> so what can I know? Um, so it is, it's a little bit more nuanced when we look at it. Thank you. Share it, subscribe, and see you next week. Creepy little book.